Hi, and welcome to Ask GMBN Tech, the weekly Q&A session. You ask us tech questions, they can be to us in the channel, they can be to our friends on EMBN, they can be to our friends on GMBN, we'll get them in into the show. So uh, direct any of your favorite presenter questions down there for a future ask uh, or anything else. Uh, use the hashtag Ask GMBN Tech. Uh, if you don't already subscribe to the channel, please do. And tell your friends about us. Free information every week, all about mountain bikes. All good stuff. Right, first question this week then is from M MTB Brian underscore zero zero one. Cool name. Um, what makes more of a difference with saddle comfort, the amount of padding or the width? Uh, this old chestnut, uh, the width, hundred percent. Right. So you could have a an inch of padding on a saddle that doesn't support your sit bones, and you'll feel comfy for a little while. And in the end, it will not feel comfortable. Uh, you've got to have the saddle um, that's correct for your sit bone. So if you look at a drawing of a pelvis, uh, I'm going to throw out some shots from Ergon. I went to visit them a while back and their company, as you might imagine, Ergonomics, that's where they came from. Uh, they look at the human body in such detail and they've basically got their own sort of way of figuring this out. In fact, they've got a calculator, I'm pretty sure, on their website. Um, I'm going to put a link to it in the description. Hopefully there might be something on the screen right now unless I've totally made that up. Uh, and it helps you identify the width of your sit bones, yeah, and how to correlate that to saddle width. So yes, they do that for the saddles that they produce, but you can also take this information to other brands. And if you look across different brands of saddle, you'll find they're done in widths. Get the correct width and everything else will fall into place. Now, of course, you might be a rider that likes minimal padding. I'm one that likes minimal padding. I'm quite comfy as long as I've got the correct width saddle. Other riders do rely on having a bit more. Uh, that is just down to your general preference. But the ultimate thing is the width every day. Uh, next question from Jonathan Watsky. Ask a Jamie Tech, is a 12-speed drivetrain for an e-bike really necessary? Couldn't something more like a seven-speed make more sense since you have the motor to make up for the lack of gears. Um, well, yeah, absolutely. And don't quote me on the time here because this is a uh, EMBN turf, but some of the earlier e mountain bikes, especially ones that came with SRAM drivetrains on them, had eight speed on them. And they had a shift that would only allow you to shift up one gear at a time because uh, when the e bike sort of movement was advancing, they didn't want people to mash through the gears and you know do a handful of gears while the torque kicks in. Of course, since then, things have come on leaps and bounds and e-bikes are running everything up to 12 speed. But yeah, arguably, you don't need that much. I don't think it's necessarily the amount of gears you've got. Um, the problem you have is the steps between them. And what I found when I rode one of those earlier eight-speed ones is I didn't like the jumps between the gears. I prefer having more of a spread of gears, uh, even if I use less of them, just because jumps between them are a bit nicer. Uh, that's a personal preference and it won't affect all riders. So you could probably still get that sort of stuff on the market. The other thing to think about is what Shimano has just released, which is Link Glide. Now this is an 11 speed system and they kind of focus it around e-bikes, but you can use this on any mountain bike. And in fact, they do 10 speed and 11 speed, but no 12 speed. The thing with this is their chain of cassette. I mean, the derailleur and the shifter, they're all optimized to use together. You can't use other gears with this stuff. It has to be the Link Glide ecosystem, we'll call it that. But the thing is, the chain of cassette designed to last, they say, over three times the length of a conventional chain and cassette that Shimano offer in the in, um, Hyperglide or Hyperglide Plus series, which that to me is amazing. So the downsides, you can only have 10 or 11 gears uh, and the cassette weighs a hell of a lot. It's a really heavy thing. However, durability, unbelievable. So if you don't like going through stuff on e-bikes and you wanna have less gears on an e-bike and you're quite happy about uh, just having a bit more weight on there, pff, that's the one. I don't think there's any contest to it. It looks amazing. Uh, I've not ridden it, mind, but it looks very, very good. Uh, next up from Richard Jensen. Yes, why again did the bike industry need boost? Okay, so this is another one that comes up. Um, so they can fit in a three inch in the back, even though three inches are rare now, or was everyone breaking 29 inch spokes all over every trail with wheels that had, had, had standard hub spacing? Please refresh my memory. Okay, so boost, in case anyone's wondering, is all to do with the rear axle width on a bike. So when mountain bikes started out, Give or take, most mountain bikes had 135 mil uh, spacing between the rear axles. We then moved up as gears got more and more to try and accommodate more things on the bike, moved up to 142 millimeters. Now this stayed around for some time until Boost came on. Now Boost went up to 148 at the back, but it wasn't just about the jump at the back. 
The reason this happened was because one by transmissions got more popular and essentially trying to improve the chain line to get it just right meant moving the chain line three millimeters out and having the extra on the back end as well. It's all about refining that chain line. Yes, one of the gains that you get with that was additional tire clearance. And another gain you could say is having a bit more room to move the hub flanges apart. The further apart the hub flanges are meant for the same amount of spokes and the same rim, Technically, on paper, you've got more bracing angles so you can build a stronger wheel, or in theory, you can have a lighter rim and less spokes um, and build a wheel that weighs the same, you know, or, or less weight for the same strength or whatever. Um, there's a number of things, but essentially it was down to chain line. That's a major thing. Now, there's two different ways that the major manufacturers achieve this. Shimano do this with cranks, so you buy according to the chain line um, that you're looking for, or there's a SRAM way and you do it with the actual chain ring. The chain rings are offset to enable that. Uh, so there's a few different ways and a few different things I had. But if you look at a modern bike with boost and a one by system on it, and you look back even just a few years to multiple chain rings on a bike, look how complicated it is around the bottom bracket there. And note how the pivot points on bikes has improved and changed. They've got a wider stance there, so a lot stronger, a lot more support, bearings don't wear out as quick. They used to be asymmetrical on most bikes to allow for the chain rings and stuff awful sort of setup really uh, from a suspension design point of view. Uh, it's a much better setup now, we've got boost, definitely. Dave, I've got a lefty fork on my bike and I never thought about asking this until I saw you, uh, Doddy. I'm sure that my cables and hoses and the combination of the left leg make a difference to my steering. Have you noticed anything? Do you know what? I have, and I totally noticed that. So uh, this is the bike I've got. I've got an Orbea Alma at the moment. It's a cross-country race frame. Uh, and actually, I normally have it with a rigid fork in it. I just wanted to try the lefty fork, uh, Curiosity Killed the Cat sort of thing. So this fork is extremely light, and as you can see, it's a left-hand leg. And most of the cable routing on my bike is on the left-hand side, like yours. Now, I think on my bike, I've noticed it only when going no-handed. It kind of does want to steer a little bit. And I think it's because the bike is so light and all the hosing is on that one side that it just moves the handlebars over slightly. It's a pretty simple thing. There's no fault, there's no craziness going on here. I think it's just to do with the hosing on that route. Uh, if I could refine my cable routing a bit or trim the hoses down or have longer hoses, I think that would make all the difference. I think that's what it is. Um, but I never really realized anyone else had thought that was a thing until you just wrote that. Uh, nice one, Dave. Uh, next up from Nick James, another lefty related question actually. Um, you've got a lefty fork on your bike, is there any play in it like we get with all dropper posts? And if not, how do they do it? And why can't dropper posts be the same? Do you know what, I'd never thought about that as a uh, dropper post angle. Right, so I've got a cutaway lefty here. Uh, you might not be able to see it, but there's gonna be some details on screen. Now the cool thing with the lefty fork, the original one had four sides. This one has three sides, and it has basically like bearings that run on each side here. It cannot move. There is no movement, there's no rattle, there's no anything. That is the secret to how this engineering masterpiece works. And I think that's why I love it, because it's so over-engineered to achieve something that you can ultimately get the same effect with two legs, uh, but there's other issues that go along with that. But when it comes to a dropper post, yeah, you've got a really Good idea, actually, here. So on, you know, obviously the roller bearings on this, there's almost no friction in them. And a dropper post, you have a bush, um, or bushing basically for the two tubes to pass through. Think of it like a suspension fork. You've got outer tube and an inner tube, and a bushing is kind of like a bearing, but a solid bearing, um, and the inner tube passes up and down over it. Now to stop them moving side to side, uh, with a regular suspension fork, you don't have the problem because you've got two legs connected. Um, lefty doesn't have the problem because of the three-sided internal but with your dropper post, you have slots. And they could have three slots or four slots and have a brass key or a softer material key that goes in those and they're normally replaceable. After a while, the saddle basically will, you know, sort of just move around. It could be a crash, anything like that. That's essentially why they have that system to protect the rest of the post. So those keys will get damaged, but the slots and the tubes will not get damaged. Ingenious system, actually. But to be fair, if someone was willing to spend a bit of money and make a post like that, make a post like you would make the lefty, that could be the ultimate dropper post. It would cost a fortune, but I would love to see it. And it definitely sounds like a Cannondale thing to do. Come on, Cannondale, make it happen. Uh, next question, Shim Tour. My Shimano derailleur isn't shifting properly. It's skipping a bit in roughly fourth, fifth gear. Sometimes it sticks in the lowest gear, okay, so right at the top, uh, and won't return properly. Limit screws are set, cable tension's good. I'm banging my head against the wall right now, help. 
I'll tell you what, I feel your pain. This is one of those things, it is process of elimination. So uh, let's start at the bottom, your hanger bolt. So check the hanger itself that the rear mech bolts onto is straight. In fact, the first thing you do, take the mech off, take the hanger off, put it on the table, make sure it's flat. If that's flat and there's no sort of bend in it, uh, that's great. If you've got a derailleur alignment tool, that's a more accurate way of testing it, but putting it on a table is a pretty good one. Get that back on, make sure the bolt is in place, make sure there's no debris between that um, and the actual frame itself that could be putting it off. Then get the bolt that holds your derailleur hanger, uh, the derailleur onto the derailleur hanger, make sure that's nice and tight. Then check your limits. Check your inner and outer limits, check your B screw, make sure they're all set as they should be. Uh, we've got videos for Shimano and SRAM, they'll be down there somewhere. Uh, then you want to check visually that your derailleur hanger, um, sorry, the derailleur lower cage is in line with that hanger. If it's bent to any sort of point, that can hamper your shifting. Um, and then of course, there's chain length, which affects things as well. Uh, and of course, the actual inner and outer cable. Now, generally speaking, I replace my inner cable once a year, and I don't always replace the outer cable, but I have had it in the past. Uh, one of the things that you're talking about, your derailleur almost sticking. I bet if you undo the cable, it doesn't stick, and I bet it's absolutely fine under its own tension. If that's the case, it is down to the cable. Uh, so you can sort of check this yourself. Best thing to do is replace the whole lot. Fresh outer cable, flush it through with some lubricant, uh, wet lube is absolutely fine for that, uh, and put a fresh inner cable, then retention, put it back together. Um, it can't be more useful without actually having to go on your own bike, but just try and think about it calmly. I know it's an infuriating thing, especially if your gears have felt fine one day and they suddenly start playing up. Uh, but just sense check it. And something as well you should just tend to do from time to time. Check all the teeth on the guide wheels and just run around your chain. Uh, when I say run around the chain, sit there looking at your joining link, pass the chain backwards all the way back around to the joining link and make sure the chain, sense check it, hasn't got any damaged links. Sometimes a damaged link or a stiff link can also hamper your shifting. Uh, hopefully that might help. Um, I feel your pain. If anyone else has got any other suggestions, uh, get involved down there. Okay, and we've got a question from Sharpie108. Uh, I've got a Roscoe 7, Trek or Gary Fisher, I can't remember between the two, uh, with 27.5 plus wheels, so 2.8 tyres on there. Uh, I'd like to switch to 29 inch wheels, uh, but the rear axle is boost 141 quick release. Having real difficulty finding any, do you know of any wheels that might fit? Okay, so standard quick release was 135, boost is 148. Um, when you have an adapter for boost to take it from boost to quick release, it makes it 141 uh, essentially is what you're looking for. Now the downside, I mean, it's an easy thing, but the downside is actually finding those. Uh, your best port of call actually probably be a Trek dealership or a Trek store, uh, something like that to get one, but you probably won't find one if you're looking for 141. It's more like a Boost 148 with quick release adapter is probably what you want to be looking for. Um, yeah, good luck with that one, but hopefully that answers the question there. Uh, any boost where the brand offers quick release end caps is what you're looking for. Uh, good luck with that one. Uh, thank you everyone for getting involved in this week's Ask Jimby and Tech. Particularly like the question about that dropper post using um, Lefty technology. Very cool stuff. Uh, see you on another show soon. Take care.